Hi everyone! Hello! Welcome to the jug. Hi. All right, welcome to the, the May meeting of the Toronto Jug. Quick bit of housekeeping, we've got, we, we've sort of expanded our social media presence. We, we now have a Google Plus group, thanks to Jeff. We have our uh, mailing list, thanks to us, and our meetup group, thanks to Adib, who uh, isn't here right now, although I think he's coming later. He's the one who ran our Java 8 tutorial day. And check out our videos, we video record all of our meetings now, and they're available on our website at tjug.ca slash videos. So Java News, thanks for posting news as you find it to the Google Plus community. So we've got a great big piece of news. There is a Java release that came out today that is not a security update. <laughs> so yay for that. What's that? Sorry? Is it good or bad? I'm is that good or bad? It's, ac it's actually a really boring release. I couldn't find anything to say about it. Because <laughs> <laughs> they updated um, the time zone database, which they do with every release. Um, they updated Java FX and Mission Control, which are sort of like separate products that have their own release cycle, and they get added in to the big JDK distro from Oracle. And uh, as with all the releases lately, it's one of the new security policies. It has a best before date of July 15th. So if you come across a website that still uses Java applets, it will give you extra warnings after July 15th if you try to run them on 7U60. And Java ME8 came out right at the end of April, just after our last meeting. So Java ME, of course, was the famous OS on every phone for a long, long time and then Android came out and that stopped happening. Uh, so now they've sort of refocused what Java ME is and Oracle's really seems to be going hard on the, the Internet of Things, which is basically embedded computing. So they've got Java ME 8 focused on wireless modules, automotive, smart sensors, all the stuff I listed there. Just little computers, usually ARM devices. And it's available for free, as in beer, and you can get it. Uh, they've got a binary for the Raspberry Pi that's like a whole OS. You can download that and it runs on a Raspberry Pi as is. And also there's a Qualcomm development board called IOE that they've also released a binary for. Uh, and there's also an emulator for Windows. So if you do any kind of embedded computing and you like Java, this might be something good to check out actually. Um, I'm not sure what the advantages of Java ME8 over Java SE 8 would be on a Raspberry Pi, for example, because that was the first thing I tried with my Raspberry Pi. I put Java 8 on it, and it worked fine. So I don't know. There's probably something special about Java ME 8 that I don't understand. Uh, ASF and Oracle are talking about TCKs again. Last time they had a good discussion about TCKs, the Apache Software Foundation ended up sort of withdrawing from the Java community process. So this looked like a good opportunity to grab some popcorn and follow along, but uh, they seem to be acting in good faith this time, and I haven't seen any sparks yet in the mailing list. But something to watch for sure. They're basically just renegotiating their access to all the TCKs, which are the test suites you have to run to claim that you implement a JSR publicly. Um, and they're trying to, they had a list of 10 things that they thought weren't great about the current agreement and they're trying to renegotiate them. But it looks like it's progressing really well. Um, there's also there's this uh, virtual jug that uh, the people behind JRebel started. It's, uh, they have their meetings on YouTube live streams and they had an interesting panel, or at least I've heard it was interesting because I haven't watched it yet, about the new appeal decision in the Oracle versus Google case where now it turns out, according to the Court of Appeals, you can copyright an API and prevent other people from implementing the same API using their own code. So that's the current state of the law in the US is that APIs are now copyrightable again. And you can't just go implement your own Java from scratch or, or anything. <coughs> uh, so there's some, uh, nobody from Oracle or Google, of course, on either of 
on the, on the panel, but uh, some Java community leaders discussing the possible implications of this new decision. There's still one more court. They, they haven't gone to the Supreme Court yet, so there's an expectation from a lot of people that Google will probably appeal to the Supreme Court. So they get, they get the final, they get like the double dog dare, and that's, <laughs> that's final, whatever the Supreme Court says. Um, and Christian recommended to me, Christian couldn't be here tonight, he's a coworker of mine, he's presented here a few times, um, most recently with Donnie about Scala. And he recommends this series, it's a three-part series from Google Developer about compression algorithms. And he said it's fun to watch, it's very informative, and it's only three parts, so your time investment is limited. So check that out. It's currently the top thing listed in the Google Developers YouTube channel. I'm planning to watch it. I haven't yet, but I will. And as always, there's the Java calendar maintained by the community. You can check out what's going on worldwide with Java. There's like multiple things every day on this calendar, so lots to see and do if you've got the time. And of course, I always miss stuff. What did I miss this month? Stuff that happened. Nothing. <laughs> awesome. I'm sure there's lots to talk about. Anyway, uh, it's time to hear from Ming about Java 8 and okay. so on. Uh, so right, so I'm going to talk about a bit about Java 8 and some of the new things that they'll let us do with in terms of accessing databases. So just to get started, I guess, Databases are amazing. They do all sorts of really cool stuff for us. We all know that. You know, things like having a multiplexing multiple people accessing the same data, working out, you know, optimal, optimal query plans for accessing the data, ensuring things are consistent even if we pull out the power. Databases do all sorts of great stuff. They're totally amazing. The problem is a lot of people don't know how to use them, and this gets us into a lot of trouble. So, for example, um, it's not really their fault. It's easy to make mistakes when using databases. So let's say we have this simple bit of code here. And it just gets a list of all the cities in Europe. So we'll serve so in this code here. We'll go to a database. And we'll run a query to get all the countries in Europe. Then we'll iterate over all, those, all of those countries. Then for each of those countries, we'll get the cities that are in each country. And then we'll iterate over those cities. And then we'll just output the names of those cities. And you think, oh, this isn't so bad. It's just three lines of code, what can go wrong? But when you actually run this, this is like 50 database calls, right? Because this is a database query, but then when you go over each country, getting the list of cities that are in each country, that's another database call. So you're hammering your database on something that looks pretty innocuous when you first look at it. And you, th you might say, okay, this, that's the, the way to solve this is we'll just get, you know, you just write a query specifically for getting things, uh, getting the list of cities in Europe uh, in one call from your uh, database. Uh, but the problem is there's doing queries in Java is just a little bit messy. So for example, here's a query that um, goes to a database and gets a list of cities. And it checks whether the temperatures of those cities are greater than a certain variable. And so there's some problems with this. And first of all is that the programmers have to learn a new language before they can write any queries. So it isn't too bad. Um, you know, query languages don't take that long to learn. But the fact that there is this additional barrier you have to go, 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 go through before you can start writing database code means it's harder to find programmers that can do this, right? You can't get someone straight out of school and say, OK, we need you to write some database queries. They have to spend a couple of months reading books and stuff first. Um, some other issues is that all this code can't be error checked uh, at, at compile time. Because all the code is in a string form, the compiler doesn't know what it's doing. So the only way to check whether the, the code is correct is to actually run it. And this sort of slows down development time, more errors, and et cetera, et cetera. Is this a Java 8? Uh, this is JPQL code. So I guess uh, like uh, Hibernate and stuff like that. So um, so basically, all the benefits of Java in terms of type checking and all that, you lose them once you start using database queries. So for example, here you return a list of the results, but what, what, what's in that list? You don't know because what's in the list is dependent on what the string does, and the compiler doesn't know what the string does. So the solution that sort of um, 
I'm proposing or that other people have proposed is, okay, well, instead of making these new query languages or whatever, we'll just translate Java directly into SQL or whatever query language that you need to access your database. Uh, the problem with this is this is a huge design space. So depending on what sort of system you design, there's different trade-offs you need to consider. So obviously you just can't translate arbitrary Java code into database queries, so you can only translate a subset. But depending on what subset you choose, you get you know, uh, different systems that are maybe more practical or less practical, or they're easier to program or less easier to program, or sometimes they, they give consistent results or sometimes not, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one such system, though, is Microsoft's Link for C Sharp. So this is a system that Microsoft made. It must be like uh, almost 10 years ago now. And it's a pretty popular system. People tend to like it a lot. And um, finally, with Java 8, we can start do it having a similar system for Java. And that's what the rest of the talk is going to be about. OK, so the basic idea is this is what we have to do now if we want to sort of do a database query in Java. And in the future, now that we have Java 8, we can do something like this. So just one line of code. Um, and it should be easy to understand once you sort of learn the new Java 8 stuff. OK? Uh, so this is an overview of what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to uh, give an overview of sort of functional programming in Java 8. Um, then I'm going to show how with this functional programming support in Java 8, we can start writing functional style queries, um, database queries in Java. And then I'm going to show you the sort of general idea of how you can build, uh, how a system like this for handling database queries in this way would actually work. Okay? Uh, so right. Functional programming in Java 8. So um, Java 8 finally brings functional programming support to Java. And this is something we've been waiting for for like 10, 15 years, basically forever. And right, we've been waiting for so long. It's finally here. It's great. We can now just start using functions everywhere. Um, it's wonderful. So here's an example, just to give an example of how the functions work in Java 8. Um, so let's say we wanted to sort some strings. OK, so we have. Uh, a list of strings here, and they have different names inside this, uh, this list. So if we wanted to do this in Java 7, the way we would sort it is we would first uh, call collections.sort, and then we would pass in the list of strings. So we, right, we just say uh, collections.sort is a static method that sorts things. And then we need to pass it, create a comparator that says how we want to do the sorting. So we create a new comparator object, and then it's a uh, a generic object, uh, so we have to pass in the type, so we're comparing strings. And then we have to override a method that takes strings that uh, returns how we want to do the comparison. And then once we're inside the code, we can actually do the comparison. So then we can take the first string, compare it to the second string. And by the time you've written all this, you basically want to kill yourself. This is like a huge amount of code for just doing like something that should be pretty easy. Uh, right, in Java 8, the same code is just one line of code, okay, to, to do the exact same thing. And if you look at the code, um, a lot of it is actually the same. So the collections.sort, you still call the exact same method you called before in order to do the actual sorting. And then you still pass in the list. The only difference is how you define the comparator. Uh, so this code, the actual code for doing the comparison, this is exactly the same as before. So this just moves over to here. Um, uh, the only difference is you don't have to define all of this. So you only have to define uh, what are the two input, uh, input parameters to your function. Um, so these two parameters, you just have to define them here. And then everything else sort of Java figures out on its own uh, through type inferencing. So basically, when you write this code, Java will automatically figure out that you're trying to create a comparator. Um, it'll automatically figure out that this code here should go inside a method called compare. Uh, it'll automatically figure out that all of these things should be strings. Um, so basically, all of this, um, all of this boilerplate code that you sort of have to write and is really annoying to write, Java will figure out for you. And you only have to write sort of the important part, which is the comparison code. So this is basically, um, you're right. This is this is the core of Java 8. This the, this sort of automatic. Uh, 
inferencing and expansion of visit these functions into all this code that you have had to write before. Um, right? Yeah. Can I say this is just syntactic sugar? Right. Uh, I'm actually going to talk about that. Oh my God. <laughs> so some some of you might argue this is just anonymous inner classes with less typing, and. Um, Right, is this just syntactic trigger, in fact, this is right here. So, uh, so you could argue that it is the case. Um, you could argue that's not the case. In reality, I, it doesn't matter because the difference is that because it's less typing, it fundamentally changes the way we program in Java. Okay, you'd think, um, oh, just it's syntactic trigger, all this stuff we could have done before using anonymous inner classes. And that's true. Except because it's less typing, we can make APIs that wouldn't be practical before. So some things, for example, here with this sorting, um, I know uh, like in Java, sometimes I'd have to make a web page and I'd have to display a list in the web page. And I'd think, okay, uh, we should probably sort this. And then I'd try to, okay, I have to write all this code. And then I'd decide, no, this is too much work. I just won't bother sorting it. If someone complains, then I'll write the sorting code. Uh, because it's just so annoying to write this. I'll be like, okay, I forget like, what it's called. And I'll forget what the method is. And so I'd have to look up the method. With this, it's like, no problem. I'll just slam this in. It's just, and the idea is that it opens up possibilities for new APIs because of the less typing. And because of that, it changes the way Java works. Is it a good thing? Like Looking at that last line there, I'm mm -hmm. not even sure what method it's called, what API is calling, like which interface is calling. Uh, um, what are the arguments S1, S2? Like, so is this a good thing for Java? Is it a good thing for Java? I would s code, yes, but. Yeah, I, you just have to get used to the style. It's great for job security. <laughs> 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 like I guess the the idea is if in a pure functional language this this would it would look like this anyways right um, like if you were to write this in JavaScript it would look sort of similar <coughs> so it's no worse than writing it in Java in JavaScript or Python or something like that JavaScript should be the, 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 the bar yeah okay okay well like you know Haskell or OCaml or whatever Scala or whatever so it it just makes uh, like you don't have to do this if you still want to write all this code you can. But it makes Java competitive in this space, finally. Uh, so basically, that's all the functional stuff in Java 8, like the crux of it. But um, one cool thing is they, now that we have the possibility of having functional APIs in Java, they started adding that to the language. So one of the things they added in Java 8 is something called the Streams API. And the Streams API is a way that to, um, it gives you a functional approach to working with large amounts of data. So if you're familiar with Scheme or whatever functional language languages you might have learned before, basically you have these stateless functions and you apply them to the elements of a list uh, using operations like map, filter, and fold, okay? Um, and it's actually, they actually use this in Java for things like Hadoop with map reduce. So the map and the reduce, the map is, is basically the map operation for func in the functional way of working with lists, and reduce is just a fold operation. So these uh, ideas are in use in Java today, but they aren't more widespread because it's too verbose uh, before. But now that we have better functional supporting Java, they can actually make an API like for doing this. Um, so yeah, I'm going to cover the Streams API since it's sort of important to understand this, to understand how database queries work. So let's say we wanted to we have this list of cities here, and it doesn't matter where we get this list of cities from, and we want to filter this list uh, so that it only has the cities that have hot temperatures. So, so let's say above 15 degrees. So in Java 7, if we wanted to do that, what you would do is you would first create a new list to hold the results. So here we're creating a hot cities variable, which is a list, just an empty list at the beginning. Then you'll take this uh, list of cities that you want to filter, and you'll iterate through all the cities in that list. And then for each of these cities, you'll check whether the temperature is above 15 degrees or whatever, whatever temperature you want. And then if it is above 15 degrees, you'll add it to your result set. So if it's above 15 degrees, you add it to hot cities. And afterwards, this hot cities list will contain all the cities where the temperature is above 15 degrees. So this is what you would do in Java 7. Uh, in Java 8, with the, uh, okay, right, so this is like five lines of code. 
it's not too bad. Like most of this is real functional code. It's not really boilerplate. Um, but one thing that's not quite perfect about it is it's sort of poorly abstracted. So let's say we wanted to rewrite this if we had like millions or say billions of cities, which may not be the case, but let's say you had millions of cities and you wanted to uh, filter them, it might make more sense to filter them in parallel across multiple threads. And if you wanted to do that, basically you'd have to throw out all this code and just write some completely new code that creates different threads and, and iterates things over different threads, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, if you wanted to do the same thing but in a different fashion, uh, you'd have to junk the code and start again. So in that sense, it's poorly abstracted. Uh, now, in Java 8, if you wanted to write the same code for finding the cities that are hot, this is what you'd do. So you'd start with your list, your cities list. Uh, from there, you'd call the stream method. And the stream method basically gives you access to the stream, the new streams API that's in Java 8. So this is what... Uh, this is what gives you the, this, the stream, right. So the, the, that allows you to start using the functional APIs for uh, working with the data in a functional way. And then you sort of filter the data uh, and you check and you write this function here. And basically what this function does is it iterates over all of the cities. And for each city, it checks whether the temperature is greater than 15 degrees. And if so, those are what it keeps. Okay. So if you look at the two things of code, you'll see that the important code is, what's, is, is, the part, is the part you have to write. So you're filtering the code here, and you only want the cities where the temperature is above 15 degrees. That's the code you have to write in the new functional version with the streams API. But all this other code here, that's basically considered boilerplate, and it, you never, don't have to write that again. It's basically hidden by this filter method. So the filter method will go through the trouble of iterating over the list and, and uh, writing this code to see if it qualifies and then adding things to results. Results set, all that stuff is now in the filter method so you don't have to write that anymore. You only have to write this part here, the part that uh, says what, what parts of the list you want. Um, so one advantage of this is now things are sort of abstracted a little bit better. So it becomes easy to parallelize. So here we have code that will iterate over a list sequentially, uh, find the cities with the temperature above 15 degrees and return those. And here's one that does it in parallel across multiple threads. The only difference is here we call stream to do it sequentially. And to do it in parallel, all you have to do is call uh, parallel stream instead of just stream. And Uh, yeah, you, I think you can always call parallel stream. Uh, like I, I haven't really looked into details in the implementation, but um, I assume they could make something that automatically times things and makes a decision. But um, right, uh, it's functional, so order you shouldn't write things that depend on the order. Um, but you could, but you aren't supposed to. Um, so right, because everything, all the code for so if doing the filtering is hidden in the filter method, all the, the details of doing the uh, filtering can be abstracted out, and that's why you only have to change this small thing. Whereas before, in Java 7, you'd just have to scrap your code and write everything again and do the filtering yourself. This is abstracted nicely, so you just have to call sort of one method difference. Okay, uh, so there's one sort of weird nuance with the streams, and that's that uh, the streams are lazy. So when you do all these sort of filtering and operations on the, on the stream of data, um, it doesn't actually uh, do anything with the data. It just sort of sets up a processing chain and then you have to sort of call something else to actually trigger the processing of the data. So just to go over this example to make it more clear. So here we call cities.stream. So basically with your list of city data, it uh, it, it creates a stream of the data, and so basically you define your data source. Here we filter the data, so we only want the data where uh, the cities where the temperature is above 15 degrees. So all this does is it sets up another step in a processing chain, but it doesn't actually process the data yet. Uh, here we call map, and basically what this says is 
for each city, we only want the name of the cities uh, instead of give, returning the whole city object. So this sets up another step in the processing chain, but it doesn't actually do any processing. Um, it's this collect method that we call at the end. The collect method is the method that actually causes things to start being processed. So collect, um, so this collect thing, uh, this method call here will uh, cause the data to be processed and it will put everything into a new list and then it will return that list. Uh, so when you call the collect, uh, it will then run the data from the source through your processing chain and dump the results into a list because that's what you said you wanted to do with the results. Yep. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm still not fully understand the, the sign of no, pointer, yes, minus and uh, div. Okay. Is, yeah. So, uh, so this is, these are the parameters to the function. So basically all of these parameters take, um, they iterate over the data and then they, re they give you the, each element of the da data in this as C. And then this is what you want to return. Something like apply on C right. this, this functionality or this yeah. no filter in this case, right? Right. Okay. And then if it's greater than 15, it keeps it. Otherwise, it discards it. And this one, it iterates through all the cities. And then and it return, it, uh, for each city, it, put, uh, it passes it into the function of C. And then it gets the name of the city. And then that will, that will be what it will put in the new list. Uh, so is there any, any, I might have gone a bit fast, is, is there any big confusion? We don't need to worry about uh, return uh, types. Sorry? Do, do we, need to worry, we don't need to worry about the return types? Uh, no, it, it, everything, type inferencing will figure it out for you. So what would happen if you skip the connect problem? So it'll set up the processing chain, but no, it won't do anything. <coughs> Yeah, it'll it'll set these up and then like it'll the you, it won't run any data through it. Um, <coughs> you iterated over the results and start processing, it, right? Or sorry, you started iterating over what what gets returned from the, the map function there, right? So, uh, so map returns a stream, so it just says it basically returns it's sort of like a linked list of of processing things, and it returns the a pointer to the last step in the processing chain or something like that. What can you do besides collect here? Uh, there's a bunch of things like you can do aggregation, like sum things up, uh, put things into a map instead of a list, things like that. They're called terminal operations in general, right? Yeah, okay. um, yeah I, I, I don't know the exact Whatever details. starts the data actually flowing. Right. So can you skip that one slide? Sure. So, oh, well, so that the bottom of the part. There's no return in this case? Yeah, in this case, uh, the, this sets up the processing chain, but doesn't do so anything. It no, answer. right. So one more question. Mm -hmm. You could add multiple filters here. Yes, so you can, you can just add as many filters to the chain as you want. Is there any way to map more than one value? Yeah, well, it basically, whatever you return here is just what's going to be in the stream. Yeah, so you'd have to create an object that holds the name and postal code and return that new object. Uh, so there might, they didn't get around to making a pair object in Java 8, but I'm sure you could get one from Gravel or something. What about the type, say? Is C in this case, uh, the type of C discovered automatically or? Yeah, so one of the main things in Java 8 is they added a lot more type inferencing. And it's a lot more advanced, so it'll automatically figure all that for you. It's based on the cities in this case, right? Until you change the type. Is that right? Yeah, it figures it out from cities that it's a list of cities, so the stream will be a stream of cities, and it'll. Then it will be a stream of. Then it will be a stream of strings. Is that right? Once it gets. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, before you mentioned that uh, it has type inference because uh, it matches like, uh, an interface mm -hmm. signature. What happens if the interface has two methods? Because before you give the example of sorting through the list of cities, where mm -hmm. the, I forgot what class it was, but it had the one method of, of compare, compare. Right, compare. so interfaces with two methods, you can't use this approach. Okay. You, you uh, can use, but you need to add a, you need to add a default uh, implementation. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is the hairy part of it. 
<laughs> yeah, so there, there's some. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so for, for in, in Java, yes, the full comprehension is it is it like startup when you do full comprehension? It's no friendly. So in Java eight for the full comprehension, is it no friendly? Uh, I'm I'm not sure the details actually. Like, uh, like even if no, that it just ignore it. I'm not sure. I haven't tried it actually. Um, I assume it would just go through, <clears throat> but they might have. Like some people argue it should be behave one way or not. I'm not sure exactly what they did. There was a debate about that, and it was originally not real friendly, mm -hmm. but because uh, they said it would be too hard and that it wasn't useful. But somebody from the community demonstrated how to let nulls pass through and it's oh, okay. not possible. But still, probably a bad idea. Is it? <laughs> probably. <coughs> okay. Um, <coughs> right, so just to summarize uh, the stuff I've been talking about Java 8 so far. So functions are just, uh, you can think of them as a, a way to do anonymous inner classes with less typing. Um, but because it's less typing, suddenly you can start doing functional style programming in Java, which wasn't practical before. And because we have support for functional programming in Java 8 now, we can now do functional style list manipulation. Uh, so we can stream out the content, contents of a list. We can then filter and transform that data as it streams through. And then we can then collect the data into a new list or wherever. Um, and these are all possible now that we have functional support. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, on the same machine, which one would perform better? Uh, probably the old Java 7 stuff would be a little bit faster, but that's just because they probably haven't d spent a lot of time optimizing the Java 8 stuff yet. Theoretically, if they spent a lot of time optimizing the Java 8, they should perform similarly. Even, uh, so you would, even, if, even for the parallel case? Well, the parallel case, you would have to, like, you, the amount of code you'd have to do that in Java 7 is like hundreds of lines of code. Um, like you, you would, like you, you couldn't, com you couldn't really compare it because it's a, they have like the huge fork join framework that they use to run this. So, um, I, I don't know. Uh, you're no longer comparing VM issues. It's more of how the framework was written. Oh, uh. Does, doesn't it use like in both dynamic to 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 actually trigger the uh, you know execute the lambda? Isn't that faster than just the you know the old way of the anonymous in the class? Right, but uh, if you write it in Java seven, you would just write the code directly. You wouldn't call. You wouldn't use anonymous in your classes. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, does it give a new data type for functions in Java eight? They wanted to, but there was no way they could get it into the language in time. So, like, they they would have to revamp the whole type system, and like, they just didn't have time to do. Uh, the question is whether there's uh, function types in Java eight. Okay, so right now I'm going to talk about functional style database queries. So now that we have functional programming support in Java, we can now write database queries in this way. So the idea of functional style database queries is we have a functional approach for working with large amounts of data and lists. So we can use the same approach for working with the data in databases because there's a large amount of data in databases as well. And this is actually similar to C-sharp's link. And I'm going to show some examples of how these database queries look. And for these examples, I'm going to use something called Jink, which is an open source project I'm working on. And basically, this is project sort of demonstrates how these functional style queries will work. Uh, so here's an example. So in Java 8, let's say you have a list of cities, and you want to get the cities where uh, the temperature is above 15 degrees. Basically, this is what you'd write. It's the same as before. You get your cities. You get a stream from it. You filter those uh, cities based on this function here. And if you want to write a, if you want to uh, write a database query that goes to a database and gets all the cities from the database and checks which ones have a temperature over 15 degrees. This is the code you would write. And if you look at these two p things of code, you'll notice they're almost exactly the same. The only difference is here where you get, you get your list of cities and you stream it out. Uh, 
if you want to do this as a database query, you just go to your database and you get a list of cities from the data, uh, a stream of cities from your database. And then other, the, only, the other difference is instead of filtering, which is what you do with a list, you would call a function called where. Uh, and this is just because uh, where is sort of borrows from the database terminology. Uh, and some people prefer that. But this could easily just have been called filter and it would be exactly the same. Uh, so that's basically the idea of how you would do database queries uh, in this functional style. So you just use the streams API and just uh, do them with databases. So you might think, okay, but is this as expressive as all the things we can do uh, with SQL or other query languages? And uh, yes, you can sort of, I've only looked at SQL 92 myself, but you can get most of the functionality of SQL 92 like similar expressive power using sort of this style of functional queries. So let's say you want to do selection where you filter things from your uh, database. You can do that uh, using a functional style. If you wanted to do a projection, so you wanted to sort of uh, change what uh, gets uh, subsets of the data or get different, uh, different columns from your data, you can just do that using a, a select or a map. Uh, if you want to join different tables together, um, you can do that by just sort of, from here you can use a navigational query for each city, you want to get a country uh, from that city, and that sort of automatically expands out into uh, a join. And you can just also call join and, and pass in a different, uh, different stream. Uh, if you want to chain together your selects and wares, um, this doesn't really have a, a SQL equivalent, but you can, you can sort of reorder your things here. As, as necessary. Um, if you want to aggregate your data, that's similar to, oh. Go back to mm -hmm. So basically, this code here, it, it goes through the cities and checks if the temperature is above 15 degrees. It checks whether the cities are in a country called Canada. It then gets the name of those cities, and then it returns those cities' names to Adford. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, in this case, well, you'd have to write different code if you change the order, but it, it doesn't matter. Like you can see the, in the SQL code, it, it doesn't matter. Is J generating Java beans for the tables? Uh, in this case, you would use, uh, you just use JPA, uh, like uh, Hibernate or something for it. Uh, right, so you can do aggregation. So if you wanted to just sum up all the data, you would do something like a collect or, or whatever. In this case, uh, there's a specific function for summing things up. All right. Uh, yeah. What is this different from the criteria API? Sorry, uh, what? The criteria API? Uh, so the criteria API, it's, it's sort of weird. This, the code that is inside the where or whatever, this would be, so basically, the criteria uh, API, they've taken a, they've created a new domain-specific language that happens to be written in Java, but it, you still have to learn in this query language. Like, it's not real Java code. Like, it's written in Java, but it's not, you can't execute that code. It's not, it's, it's sort of an abstract syntax tree uh, that happens to be written in Java. Uh, How's that different? I mean, this is the same thing. Mm, well, this is this is real Java code, so you can actually run this against like you can you can run this code. It's it's you can run criteria code as well. Like it's it's Java code, right? Well, it's it's it is Java code, but then it's not it's it's basically your it's basically a way of expressing um, a different query language in a type safe way with Java. I, I'm not, I'm not sure if that makes sense, but. Um, you can take this code and run it against like normal data, like in a list, uh, like a list of in-memory data. Whereas something like criteria code, it's it's not. You can't really do that. It's it's very. It's they've created a, this language specifically for databases, and then they've embedded it in Java, so you can sort of construct uh, the the syntax tree for this other query language in Java. And they try to make it so it looks as close to real Java as possible, but it's like you can't do something like greater than 15 in, uh, 
in criteria. You'd have to you'd have to call uh, a greater than method and then pass in like some other stuff and things like that. So what's the type of DB here? Um, it would be in this case it would be something that wraps the entity manager or something like that. I, I'm okay. um, yeah. Uh, you would probably you'd, you'd write that code yourself to return a stream of cities. Um, uh, so you can also do things like grouping. Um, yeah, here it starts getting a little bit messy, but I guess uh, grouping is possible. And you can do subqueries. Uh, I'm not sure if I have subqueries working in the current version of Jink. I've had it working before, but uh, it may not. Uh, I've, I'm not sure if this particular subquery works. So basically the idea is with, uh, with these sorts of um, queries, so even with this functional stack queries, you get similar <laughs> expressive query power as SQL 92. Uh, in some cases, the syntax looks a bit messy, but I guess the syntax can still sort of evolve a bit. Um, but I'm also not sure whether it just might be an inherent property of complex queries. Like, if you're trying to do something complex, uh, you might have to write complex code. I'm not sure if you can actually make it look nice. But again, it's evolving, maybe, maybe that can improve. There are two caveats, though. One is how nulls are treated. Um, in this case, um, when translated to a database query, they'll run using whatever semantics are in the database but the semantics of null in the database might be different from the semantics of null in Java. <coughs> For in SQL, we have the three value logic where nulls can, are actually things that you can use in comparisons and stuff. But in Java, if you would actually run the code, uh, you'd get a null pointer exception. Um, so it's not clear, the code you write, it's Java, but then when it's run on a database, it won't be exactly the same as the code you write. The other caveat is it's hard to make new data structures. Um, in SQL, it's easy to return sort of new tables with rows of, with new names. In Java, that's sort of messy. You have to create a new class. It's hard to sort of write these sort of uh, impromptu data structures just for holding multiple things of data from your database. Um, in, in Link and C Sharp, they got around this by, I think they added special data types to let you do these sort of three-valued logic things, and then they added some special features to let you create new data structures on the fly. That's, but not, that's not really new. If, we, if you do that in the, currently in the, with an ORM in Java, you end up with a, you just end up with a primitive array of objects. Yeah, so sure, sure. But it's, 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 not, it's not pretty, though. You have to know about what that is yeah. yourself. So. Uh, like, I have something here that like, you can use pair objects to hold things, and I have tuple objects. But it's just not, it's not as nice as, as where you have an actual object with named fields. OK, so some interesting properties of these functional style queries is that the code, uh, the code is executable. So the code that you use to query your database is real Java code. And you can actually run the code as is and not as a database query. So you can just run the code uh, and run it. and. It'll stream all of, the, all, of, all of the cities, say, from your database, and you can filter it on your machine. And this is really inefficient, but it's actually possible to just run the code directly without uh, converting them into database queries. So in a way, the running things of database queries is an optimization. Um, I'm, 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 it's not really that useful to do this, but it's sort of an interesting sort of tw uh, way of looking at it. Um, plus, you get compile time error checking and fewer security issues, which I'll, I'll discuss in more detail. So um, the, fa the fact that the code is executable, like it gives you sort of, just to explore this property in a little bit more detail. Um, let's say you have a database of web log visits, so basically all the visits to a, a web server, and you keep them in a log, and you store them in database, and you want to go over these logs and find all the visits to a certain URL. So you go over each page, and you're in your, web, in your web logs, you check the URL that's being visited, and if it's equal to the URL, you want to keep those. So basically, this is a, a database query. Um, it's real code, um, right? I've discussed this all before. Um, if you wanted to rewrite, use this code to work with objects in memory, all you have to do is, instead of getting your 
sort of list of logs from a database, you can just get a list of web log data in memory, uh, convert it into a stream, and then run the exact same code. Um, and another weird twist uh, is that you can sort of use the same syntax for non-database operations. So here, um, this converts into a database query, but you could also write something like, for each page from the database, uh, get the IP address and look up the country, like go on the internet and look up the country where the IP address is from and check whether it equals to Canada. So this code uh, can't be converted into a database query because it goes onto the internet to look up uh, a country. But you can still write it using the same sort of functional syntax. Um, I'm not sure what the use of this is, but it's sort of an interesting property of these sort of functional style queries. Uh, that comes from the fact that this is real Java code. Uh, so another ni nice thing is that your queries have fewer errors. So here your, uh, right, in JDBC or JPQL or whatever, you always have to write your queries as a string. Uh, but because this is real Java code, it can be checked uh, by the Java compiler and check for errors. Um, here we have a SQL injection error because someone was just too sloppy to do use a set parameter. They just threw in the string right there. Uh, that's not possible with sort of these functional style queries because all the executable part is written as real Java code. Um, this is all probably type checked, whereas you know with JDBC you can't do the type checking. Um, because this is real Java code, you can uh, also get code completion. So if you have your page and you aren't sure what sort of are the methods on page, this is actual real Java code, your Java compiler. If you press uh, control space, it'll give you a list of methods and you can just use uh, your code completion to get, get stuff. Uh, so, right. so to summarize, I've shown you that you can use sort of this uh, stream syntax to query databases. Um, so this functional syntax. The power of this sort of syntax is similar to SQL, and they have some weird properties, like the code is executable, and there's fewer errors. Uh, and now I'll discuss how you can actually get the system to work. Um, so I showed before that the queries are written using real Java code, but because it's written in real Java code, it's not clear how to translate this into SQL, uh, or whatever database query language you want. Um, C sharp with its link, in order to get this to work, where you write your database query code in C sharp, they had to change their compiler uh, specifically to support this. Uh, the problem is when you do these sorts of changes, it's sort of in inelegant because it's not general purpose. It's like these changes are specific to getting database uh, support to work. And although they've tried to use the mechanism for other things, uh, I, they haven't really found anything useful to do with it besides uh, letting you write database queries in C Sharp. Um, and because, because it's only useful for database queries, it's probably unlikely to ever get into Java. So if you were to propose to the Java standards people, or oh, we want to add database support right into the language, basically it would take 10 years for them to agree to it. And even then, like, it would just take too long and it probably wouldn't happen. So you'd need to find some other way of sort of implementing this sort of stuff. Uh, now you could just make sort of a custom compiler that would support this. The problem with custom compilers is they sort of have poor integration with these ex existing tools. So I could make a special Java compiler that had support for sort of these functional queries, but would it work in Eclipse or NetBeans? Probably not. And then um, every time they came out with a new version of Java, you'd have to come out with a new compiler. It's sort of a bit of a mess. Uh, so. The way around this is to use bytecode analysis instead of uh, mucking around with the compiler. And the reason why you can use bytecode byte analysis better than writing your own compiler is that the bytecode format for Java is fairly static. Like it doesn't change that much from version to version. So if you write, um, if you write, a, write a mechanism for supporting databases through bytecode analysis, uh, it, it's, it, it will probably be supported for a fairly long amount of time. <laughs> Uh, the problem is it's a little bit tricky, and two ways it's tricky is that different compilers produce slightly different output. So you need some sort of mechanism that can handle these sort of different outputs that a Java compiler might output. And 
it's also just basically hard to translate imperative code to query code. So query code is declarative. Uh, imperative code is just a sequence of instructions of how you want to actually uh, execute something. And this translation is pretty rare. So it's not 100% clear how to do it. Um, so I'll give an example of how it's done in Jink, just so that you sort of understand what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, so let's say you have this code here. It's the same code as before, where we have a database query that goes to a database, gets a list of cities, and checks whether the temperatures of the cities are greater than 15 degrees. The different compilers might compile it in different ways. Um, it might compile it like this, or it might do something with uh, ifs and go tos and something. This is actually closer to what uh, the Java compiler actually produces. But uh, I'll use this as an example just because it's shorter. Um, this isn't real bytecode because it'll take too long to go over bytecode. But it's our simpler, simpler code that will give you a feel for how the algorithms <coughs> for the translation works. So basically, um, the idea is when you want to generate a, a query from your, your code, this is what you'll see in sort of the translation algorithm. And you have to generate a query from this. And if you want to generate a query from this, uh, you basically have to understand what it does. And one way to understand what it does is you pass some parameters, run it through the code, and see what happens. Uh, so one thing you can do, uh, so just an example, you'd, you'd, um, you'd have some uh, fake, uh, fake data, like Toronto 10 degrees. You'd run it through this code and check what happens. Uh, run it through the function. So basically, you want to keep track of all the things that change uh, in the state of your program by running the code. So first, you, you set the input to the function to Toronto 10 degrees. Then you run this code that sets A to 15. So this is something that changes when you run the code. Uh, this A variable becomes 15. Then you want to get the temperature of C. C is Toronto 10 degrees, so the temperature is 10. So this is assigned to B. Then you want to compare B to A. Uh, in this case, B is smaller than A, so C becomes false. And then you return C, so C is false, so you return false. So this is basically what you do as a person if you want to sort of understand what the code does. Um, this is obviously not practical for a computer because the computer can't just make up random data and try to understand what goes on. Um, so if you want to get a computer to sort of use the same approach to understanding code, one thing you can use is something called symbolic execution. And basically, you make fake data and run it through the code. But the fake data are, is basically composed of symbols. And you sort of execute the code using symbols instead of with real data. So in this case, instead of having C be Toronto 10 degrees, C is just the simple input. So there's some input. We don't know what it is. And we're going to run it through this function. So when you get the input, uh, C is input. So C is the simple input. Then we run the first line of code. A is 15. So we know that A is 15. <laughs> then we get the temperature of C. And C is just the simple input. So when we run, get the temperature of C, basically we get the input symbol and we get the temperature of that. And this is what we put into B. Then we check whether B is greater than A. So in this case, B, which is this, goes here. And then A, which is this, goes here. And we put that into C. And then we return C. So C is this huge sort of string that we've computed. And we just return that. And then so basically, this is the result of executing this code symbolically. And uh, these variables here are local variables. So once we exit the function, they sort of they don't matter anymore because anything we store in them is gone. So basically, the effect of running this function is this. It returns the input to the function. Uh, we get the temperature, and we check whether it's greater than 15 degrees. So from this, we can uh, now that we know how to understand uh, the code that's passed in as functions, we can then sort of start generating queries using this sort of understanding. So uh, this is how query generation works. So when you call your database and get a stream of cities, this is sort of the SQL query that would be generated to get uh, all the cities in the database. And then when you call this where method um, and you pass in this function, what happens is inside the where method, it looks up, 
it uses the symbolic execution to understand what this function does. And it, it, uh, running the symbolic execution, it realizes what this function does is it gets the input, it checks whether the temperature is 15 degrees, and that's, that's what it returns. And from that, it can just add this to the query. And this is how you generate your query. So this is the basic idea of how uh, the query generation works. And so sort of all the, it does, it, it goes, it skips a lot of details, but this is the general idea of, of the algorithm. So the basic idea of the inner workings, it's sort of messy, but it works. And because it's all done through bytecode analysis, it integrates well with existing Java tool chains. So all this, it can be done at runtime. So you don't need to change your compiler, your debugger, your refactoring tools, all that stays the same. It's just at runtime, it automatically converts things into queries. And it's actually pretty reliable. So there's no surprising behavior. If you write things in a way that can be converted into a database query, it'll be converted into a database query. Uh, right. So in conclusion, Java 8 has support for functional programming now. And now that we have support for functional programming, we can finally get functional style database queries. And because Link is so popular in C Sharp and people have sort of been de demanding the same thing for Java, it's probably inevitable that this will eventually come to Java in the future as well. Um, and if you want to try it out, uh, there's an open source project that I'm working on called Jink that you can try it out and it now has support. Uh, I've most recently added support for sort of Hibernate and, and so you can sort of start using it if you already have a JPA project. Okay, that's it. So select before. Uh, you know, big, big, big volume of data, millions of, uh, of rows. Mm -hmm. uh, will, will I run into problems of performance or whatever? Well, like it's all translated into a database query, right? So it's all run on the database. What? So it's actually the same as it was before. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's it, assuming the query generation works. What you write will be gen will generate a, a real database query that's as efficient as just writing the database query yourself. Yeah? You said that the, the query translation can be done in runtime, but is it necessarily done in runtime? Uh, well, in the implementation, <laughs> well, you can do it, if you do it before runtime, you you need to add an extra step to your Java tool chain. So it's possible, it's just, it's, it's really hard, you like you'd have to shoehorn some build system, shoehorn it into your build system somehow. And uh, I'm not sure people want to do that. Yep. So, so how is it, you, your example is db.city strings, right? Mm -hmm. So I assume the like, city can be a JPA entity, right? So right. How, did, how does that, like, you know, I add a new entity, how does the db object now have access to, like, do you have any code that, that shows how it actually integrate that with JPA? Uh, yeah, so I guess uh, I have a slide here. In fact. So basically, um, you'd have, um, so you have your entity manager factory, and the entity manager factory, your entity manager has information about all the JPA classes. So basically, you pass it into this thing that generates streams from JPA uh, from your entity manager, and from there you can then. So this is called streams. From there, you can generate a stream just by passing in your entity manager and then the class you want to stream out of your database. And. You talk a lot about select. Hmm? You talk a lot about select. There's yeah. Other, there's other verbs in uh, SQL. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, so. Well, like the, the key, the, the main power is select and where, and then the subqueries. Um, yeah. The other stuff is a lot of it's syntactic sugar. Um, if you can get the subqueries and the select and where working, then the other stuff sort of falls in. Well, okay. How far? How far? When are you going to release, like, you know, like a proper release for Um, I don't know, I'm only one guy, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, my, 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 my question is really, like, have you looked at the scholars in a slick uh, implementation? Yeah, so, you know, yeah, so, like, I'm from EPFL, so that's, this, that's the university that produces Scala as well. Okay. So I know those guys. Um, right. 
yeah, it's everyone sort of has been discussing. They have a different implementation that where basically they have a way of overriding the compiler. So it's like an extra stage in the compiler that you can sort of plug in. Um, for Java, like I said, it's not practical in Java because Java won't let you sort of muck around in the compiler. Like those extensions? I'm not a, a sure of the exact implementation. Uh, but uh, in order to make this practical in Java, uh, it's just easier to do that through bytecode analysis. Right. With Scala, because they control the whole language and they're sort of more receptive to changing the compiler <laughs> to add fe you know, these features like database support, um, you can do it that way too. Well, my, my, my real question is, Scala still doesn't do the invoke dynamic. That means it's still slower because they have their own sort of way of, you know, generating the class to get around the bytecode, you know, the JQ. Right, right. But all of this stuff. is translated into database queries, right? So it doesn't matter <coughs> the implementation of the functions. It's all ignored once it's compiled I, to a database query. I, I like to see a port of Slick for Java, meaning that using Java 8, you know, using all the Lambda stuff to do Slick. Because even if I use Slick now, it's going to be still slower for native Java implementation. Yeah, I, I, I assume the Scala type safe people are working on it. It's 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 just a matter of time, right? Uh, yeah. uh, like Java is not it's Java, 8. Java eight. Yeah, well, uh, yeah. yeah, of course, right? Like if yeah. it's faster, well, it's they're going to be do. Like two point, you know, three or something. Yeah, like they're getting paid for it now, so I assume they're they're going to do it at some point. Okay, so I guess that's it. Oh, uh, yeah. Just uh, one more question about um, your queries. So in a lot of cases, when you work with databases, you need to build dynamic queries. Mm -hmm. um, what's your thought on that, or is that not appropriate in this situation? Yeah, then you'd use like the criteria API or something like that. Or yeah. Like you can sort of do it a little bit. Like th these uh, these queries. Uh, like this is all done at runtime, so you can compose them uh, as you want. Sure. Uh, but the code in here, like that, has to be static. Like, could I assign it to a variable and then, you know, conditionally be doing that variable? Yeah. Sure. Okay. okay. Thank you.